After finishing his PhD work in biochemistry and molecular biology at UC San Diego and subsequent postdoctoral work in bacterial genetics at Caltech back in the early 90s, Dr. Jeffrey Stein has built a long and distinguished career around developing therapies and later developing uh, biotech companies focused on killing the microscopic stuff that makes people sick. That's an oversimplification, obviously, but it's accurate. Over the course of his career, Dr. Stein has made huge contributions to the development of antibiotics, antimicrobials, antivirals, and antifungals. Since 2014, Dr. Stein has been CEO at Cydera Therapeutics, a company working on a new concept called antiviral conjugates, and he's joining me today to talk about it. Dr. Stein, welcome to the show. Matt, thanks for having me. Awesome. Did I get that, uh, that, that little preamble correct? Uh, pretty much. You know, I uh, did do my PhD in uh, molecular biology, biochemistry at UCSD. The other detail there is my degree was actually in marine biology as I did my work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Ah. So uh, probably not a conventional background for a biotech CEO, but uh, an important one. No, it's very cool. Yeah, unconventional is cool. There's always a backstory there. Do you maintain a, an interest or any semblance of a practice in marine biology? Uh, mostly just my uh, location uh, here in San Diego with the ocean view. Um, when I was a grad student at Scripps, I had what I thought would be the best office I would ever have in my life, uh, overlooking Scripps Pier and the beach and Black's Beach and so forth. And then... Um, Later on, uh, here I am working from my home office where I have a similar view. So it's, it's nice to go uh, for full circle. No, oh, that's super nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't say the same here in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania. Our <laughs> is a bit kind of gray and stark at this point, but uh, very cool. So I, I want to start with, uh, with the entrepreneur in you. So back in, in 1999, you, you jumped into biotech entrepreneurship around there when you, when you founded Quorex. Um, what what motivated the move? I think prior to that point, your career was kind of in the chief scientific officer role. Uh, what motivated the move to uh, entrepreneur and founder? Yeah, a couple of things, both uh, kind of external and internal. Um, you know, throughout my career, externally, I've had the great fortune to have fantastic mentors and colleagues that come into my circle or vice versa. And in the case of uh, my first company, Corex, I had two individuals. And at that time, I was a chief uh, you know, scientific officer at Diversa Corporation. Uh, I was leading the uh, kind of molecular diversity group. Uh, what we were doing at the time is going worldwide, collecting samples of microorganisms uh, and seeing if we can clone genes that encoded thermostable uh, enzymes or enzymes that were adapted to extremes of pH and so forth. Um, at that time, I was kind of developing an approach where we go to multi-gene pathways that encoded bioactive small molecules, including antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So while I was at Agaron, uh, Institute uh, prior to Diversa, uh, I was uh, working on this, and this was an offshoot of my work at Caltech. Well, I had a colleague at Agaron, Bonnie Bassler, uh, who went off and she is now chairman of molecular biology and biochemistry at Princeton University, a MacArthur fellow, National Acad Academy member, uh, incredibly distinguished career. But back then, uh, in the early 90s, we were just kind of, you know, postdocs, early stage researchers at, at Agaron. And uh, we stayed in touch throughout the year. Uh, she went off to academia. I went into biotech. Um, and I remember there was a, a, you know, we had regular calls. And in December of 1998, we had one of our regularly scheduled calls. And she said, Jeff, I found this really interesting phenomenon uh, bacterial quorum sensing. Uh, basically, it is the ability of bacteria to recognize one another's concentration. <clears throat> so if you are, let's say, a pathogenic bacteria, um, you don't start making uh, virulence factors until you get to a certain threshold population within the body. And what she did is discover these precise small molecule that is the communication signal that induces virulence. And I found that not only academically fascinating, but the applications, potential applications were huge, right? And I was working from the other end 
in trying to you know synthesize bioactive molecules that you know including antibiotics and so you know i asked her have you filed patent on this she goes yeah we, i just did well let's see if we can form a company uh, mm-hmm. And so we, the two of us were co-founders of, um, of Corex, which we founded uh, the, the following year. And so, you know, that's really how I went, you know, I was pretty much focused on the academic pathway back then. Yeah. Uh, but then that was really the pivot point for me to go into biotech. And, uh, but, you know, directly to your question, um, you know, I didn't have any experience on you know, finance and yeah. all the other critical elements in, you know, being su- in a successful entrepreneur. And so this is the other uh, kind of important element that drove my career is having great mentors uh, as well as colleagues. And uh, I uh, was, you know, I kind of hooked up with a uh, venture capitalist, Robert Robb, who uh, really was the first inv- investor in Corex. And uh, he really shepherded me. I learned from him. I was a pretty good science communicator. And so I was critical in communicating the vision of the company uh, to potential investors. Uh, and he was a great finance guy with all the connections. So it was a great partnership. Uh, and we advanced that uh, company and ultimately ended up selling it uh, to Pfizer in uh, early, when was that? 2005, I believe. So anyway, it was a, it was a good run. Uh, and then, um, you know, joined uh, uh, Sophie Nova Ventures as a Kaufman fellow and started uh, another company, Trius Therapeutics. So yeah. um, again, you know, good mentors, good colleagues all along the way. Yeah. You, uh, once you sort of had that, uh, the, 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 um, initial experience at Quarex, you know, sort of playing off of those, um, those advisors that, that you mentioned, did, did you develop sort of a, a bug to kind of keep that going? I mean, was it, was it kind of, you know, turning the corner and moving towards industry and away from academia uh, full throttle? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it is a very, you know, meritorious system uh, that also requires incredible luck. Mm-hmm. And I've just had incredible good fortune of having, you know, great mentors and colleagues all along the way. Um, I can't say it was all due to my own skill. I just think I had the right people come into my orbit at the exact right time. Yeah. And since then, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Trias Therapeutics. And uh, since then, you, you've also become uh, and maintain a board membership uh, with, with the antibiotic company Paratech. Uh, you did multiple stints as chairman of the Antimicrobials Working Group. Um, so the other part of your, I guess, backstory that uh, that I'm intrigued by is this uh, inspiration around, uh, you know, the, the focus on, on, on killing microorganisms, right? Like, uh, obviously <laughs> you mentioned from the outset, you come from a marine biology background, a <laughs> lot, a lot of different directions you could have t- taken your, uh, your career. Why, why the focus on, uh, on battling microorganisms? Well, that certainly was one of the, you know, early interests, right. Uh, all the way from my postdoc days at, at Caltech, um, you know, could we, um, clone and express multi-gene pathways that uh, encoded novel antibiotics. You know, most of the antibiotics uh, that we've used historically um, are natural products. They are manufactured by, you know, bacteria or fungi. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, we can only grow, you know, less than 0.1% of the bacteria and fungi that are in the natural environment. And that was really inspired that early work. And I've continued uh, along those lines, getting you know, far afield from natural products uh, and you know, cloning and expressing those products. Uh, and now uh, really the, the focus is on completely novel mechanisms because of the incredible unmet need. Yeah. You know, the, the resistance is continues to be an important issue for not only you know, bacterial infections, fungal infections and viral infections. Certainly, we're seeing, uh, you know, the, the need really highlighted with the, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there's always going to be a need uh, and it is uh, a real battle trying to keep up with these uh, infectious microbes. Mm hmm. So uh, about seven years ago, you made the move to Sidera, and what prompted that move? Well, we had sold Trius to uh, Cubist Pharmaceuticals 
in 2013. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was figuring on taking a you know, bunch of time off. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is kind of the serendipitous element. I was approached by uh, three individuals who were the scientific founders of the early stages of Sidera. It wasn't a fully formed company at the time, mm -hmm. but it was based on this concept of um, can we apply the principles of immunotherapy, which has revolutionized the treatment of cancer, can we apply those principles to infectious diseases? Most specifically, can we apply you know, bispecific immunotherapies, which really has transformed uh, oncology? And so they had some early data, and, and this was uh, Kevin Forrest out of 5AM Ventures, Kevin Judies, who was the original uh, CEO of Acajan Pharmaceuticals, and uh, H. Shaw Warren of Mass General Hospital. So they were the you know, conceptual scientific founders of the company, um, financed by seed financing from 5AM Ventures. Uh, about two months after we sold Trius, they approached me and said, hey, you know, check this out. So they had some incredible uh, early data. It was still very much in the scientific experiment stage, but it just fascinated me. Uh, you know, and, and I think throughout my career, you know, I'm very attracted to potential approaches that can revolutionize a field of medicine. And certainly this was that. So uh, based on that, uh, I, they invited me to join as a co-founder and CEO. So we formally uh, founded the company in January 2014. When uh, I joined as CEO, we ended up uh, raising a um, Series A round of financing that February. Uh, that was a venture round. Uh, the following, I'm sorry, that was March, then the following February, we um, uh, did what's called a crossover round where we had a number of public institutional investors that did very well from the Trius exit uh, join in a financing round uh, that enabled us to go public, which we did in April of 2015. So very fast path from really starting operations in January of 2014 as the first employee uh, to going public uh, in April of 2015. And it was based on two things, the promise of that this novel approach. But, you know, we realized that it was still very much a science experiment. We needed to nurture that program. Yeah. So we brought in or acquired a more advanced, meaning a late preclinical antifungal molecule, uh, which again, uh, had all of the early attributes to really revolutionize the treatment and prevention of invasive fungal infections. And that molecule is now called Resifungin. It's in two phase three studies. Um, when we went public, you all, you know, the, all the attention is focused on the most advanced program in your portfolio. And so all the attention is, was focused on resifungin, but that actually was a good thing. It enabled us to really advance uh, the, what is called the cloud break ABC or antiviral conjugate program in stealth mode in the background. Yeah. Uh, it started off as an antifungal program uh, because we already had an antifungal, we evaluated antibacterial and then antiviral applications. And the latter was really the sweet spot, which we hit upon about two years ago, mm -hmm. was this fusion of a very potent antiviral drug to the FC domain of a human antibody. And that turns out to be a very magical combination, which really combines all the strength of a potent antiviral molecule with the strengths of a monoclonal antibody and the strengths of a vaccine, uh, all in one molecule without the weaknesses of, of those other approaches. Yeah. So, and is that sort of the, the, the groundwork for the cloud, cloud break anti, antiviral platform? That's right. Yeah. So we started off with influenza, clear unmet need. Um, you know, people have been talking about the so-called universal flu vaccine for the last 50 years. It has not come to fruition. It may never come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some good antiviral drugs out there, but they suffer from resistance uh, and other weaknesses that prevent broad use of those drugs. Um, so we really focused on influenza. 
And we now have two development candidates and we're preparing to uh, get those into the clinic, hopefully filing uh, our IND ne sometime next year. All right, I'm gonna ask you some very, a couple of very basic uh, questions that will uh, probably expose my lack of understanding, but hopefully, hopefully clarify <laughs> for our audience. So, so let's start with uh, classic, uh, I guess, historical classifications of therapeutics. And we'll go at a, at a very basic level, large molecule, small molecule, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, my perception from discussing this with you and having read a little bit is that you don't fall neatly into either one of those buckets. Exactly. Um, it is. So if we take, for example, CD377 or 388 are two development candidates. Mm -hmm. um, the bulk of that molecule from a molecular weight perspective is a large molecule. It is a biologic. So it is a fragment of a human antibody. So it ha you have to manufacture it by growing you know, cell lines, right? So that very much is a large molecule uh, biologic. Uh, the active part of it, however, is a small molecule, and this is a neuraminidase inhibitor. It is a small organic molecule that is you know, synthesized through organic uh, you know, medicinal chemistry means. Um, so it's a combination. So the, these molecules are a conjugate of that very potent small molecule neuraminidase inhibitor fused to the FC domain of the uh, human antibody uh, biologic. So you really have two different manufacturing processes and then that combination, that conjugation of the two. The business of biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at CytivaLifeSciences.com backslash Emerging Biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A LifeSciences.com backslash Emerging Biotech. Okay, so that leads to, a, 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 I'm going to take you down a rabbit hole, <laughs> at least with some more questions about, uh, well, first, uh, regulatory structure. So who, who's, who, are, who are you facing from the FDA as far as uh, regulatory considerations are concerned? Uh, this would be the antiviral division. Okay. So, uh, you know, currently, you know, with our antifungal program, we're in the infectious disease uh, division. So it is a different division, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they are the ones who will be uh, reviewing our applications. Okay. Um, and then on the manufacturing side, the, you just sort of underscored the complexity, uh, the, this, this conjugation. Uh, it, it, it's it's got to be more complex than, you know, manufacturing either a small molecule or a large molecule. Talk to me about that. How do you, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to go too deep into the manufacturing process, but I'd like an overview and I'd like an understanding of how you, you know, rationalize, especially among the investment community as a, as a relatively new company, you know, mm -hmm. how we're going to go about this seemingly complicated and maybe uh, IE expensive manufacturing approach. That is a really important question, Matt. I'm glad you asked that, uh, you know, Based on how compelling the data are that we have, or you know, it's um, probably obvious that we're in discussions with various pharmaceutical partners. One of the first things they do in d diligence and technical diligence is, well, how is this manufactured? What's the cost of goods for manufacturing? A very critical element, especially for something that could be a um, broadly used preventative that could be a replacement for the flu vaccine, because vaccines are relatively cheap once the manufacturing processes have been worked out. So we've been focusing on that from the outset. And we have a couple of real advantages here is number one, you know, the FC domain can be manufactured uh, at scale. So right now, for example, our current estimate for the cost of goods is less than $25 a dose, hmm. right? And the reason it's so, uh, so low compared to other biologics is because these molecules are so exquisitely potent. It doesn't take a lot. So now we have in CD377, 
a molecule that has a very um, you know, robust antiviral activity uh, and that can be administered, we forecast, as a single subcutaneous or intramuscular injection once every three to four months, which is pretty much the length of the flu season, typically 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. We have our uh, other molecule, CD388, which has the attributes such that it could be administered once every six months, right? It has a slightly attenuated immune response, but it has that longer half-life. So think of it as getting a flu vaccine, but unlike flu vaccines, it will work against every known strain of influenza, pandemic and seasonal strains. And the advantage this approach has over any vaccine is that it works in all people. So in order for you to respond to a vaccine, you have to have a robust immune system to mm -hmm. mount an immune response, right? So in the US, there are about 100 million people who uh, simply for various reasons, they're elderly, they're young, uh, they have a weakened immune system, they are on anti-inflammatory drug regimens that they are unable to mount a robust immune response to vaccines. And you know, we're hearing a lot about this now with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we get around that by not needing to have an immune response. Uh, we actually, uh, the immune response is actually part of the molecule, right? It's the FC domain of a human antibody, which then uh, provides a directed focused immune response on top of the potent antiviral activity. And consequently, these molecules are exquisitely potent and you don't have to manufacture a lot to get a dose that is effective. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I'm, I'm trying to trying to figure out uh, the order in which I want to ask follow up questions to that. So, uh, <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll highlight uh, uh, one um, difference from a monoclonal antibody, for example. Yeah. So we heard about, you know, President Trump getting the Regeneron molecule. So that was, um, they tested two doses, uh, uh, one a four gram dose and the other is an eight uh, uh, gram dose and uh, President Trump received the eight gram dose. Right. That is a huge amount of drug. And you know, now we're hearing that there's gonna be some real challenges for Regeneron to manufacture enough of that molecule and it's going to be incredibly expensive because that is a big dose, whopping dose of drug. Yeah. Our, our molecules are over a thousand fold more potent. Uh, and because of that, we don't have the same manufacturing challenges. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Le do, doing a, a lot more with a lot less. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Um, so the, the frequency of administration, uh, you know, you, you, in either case, you're looking at slightly more frequent administration than, you know, perhaps a, a single dose vaccine. Um, although, I guess some of the some of the vaccines in the works now, they're, they're you know, are, are looking more like multi dose. But in any event, like in, in, a, in the administration of, of a, of a I'm not even sure whether to call this a vaccine or a therapeutic. Let's start oh, there. So that was, the other, that was the other baseline I wanted to tap. Yeah, uh, call it an AVC. <laughs> an AVC. It's kind of yeah. somewhere in the middle, right? Right. Um, are, are we talking about self-administration? Is it? Is this a clinically administered uh, shot? Uh, we envision it could be administered in the clinic or on an outpatient uh, basis, such as you know, wherever you can get a flu vaccine, you should be able to get uh, an AVC. Yep. Okay. All right. And you, um, you, you don't anticipate, like, as far as the marketability is concerned, uh, you don't anticipate that, uh, that there's a specific demographic that you'll be, you'll be targeting, you know, the, the elderly, the immunocompromised, to your point, it, it, it's. Yeah, we're evaluating that right now. Should we go into, um, you know, a high risk population first who could benefit from it the most, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or should we uh, go initially into the broader population? Current, you know, my preference is really to do it as a stepwise approach, uh, but then you know, potential pharmaceutical partners have um, you know, other ideas that we're evaluating as well. Sure, yeah. And I wanted to get to one thing you mentioned, um, you know, that doesn't have the same um, half-life or, or dose, you know, dosing uh, as a vaccine, um, the exception to that really is for influenza, right? We saw in last year's flu season, 
we had an initial spike of uh, influenza A, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, then we had influenza B come in the second half. Um, the flu vaccine from last year did not cover that, right? So you actually needed two sh shots to cover the, uh, the flu season from last year. CD388 could potentially have uh, you know, covered that with a single administration. And that, that, that seems to be the perennial challenge as far as flu vaccine. I don't know about perennial, but it's a, it's a, it seems to be a routine challenge, you know, uh, around the flu vaccine and that um, the, the virus changes. Uh, the, the vaccines are only so effective that the vaccines, therefore, have to change continuously. And you're saying that your, 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 your AVC, I won't call it a therapeutic or a vaccine, <laughs> your AVC will, uh, will solve to that, that problem. That's right. You know, historically, the vaccine effectiveness of uh, flu vaccines was about 49 percent historically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last year it was um, around 28 uh, percent. And in the, you know, the population over 65, it was about 12 percent vaccine effectiveness. So that does not engender a great deal of confidence in the flu vaccine. Right. Right. And that's one of the challenges, right? In order to be broadly protective, uh, to get the so-called, you know, herd immunity we're all learning about here, um, you have to have a vaccine effectiveness above 60%. Uh, and you have to have people get the drug, right? And if so if you have vaccine deniers or people who simply don't think it's worthwhile because the effectiveness is so low, then you're not going to slow the spread of any viral infection. Yeah, indeed. I mean, you know, I think it was yesterday or the day before. This, this won't air for quite a while, but, you know, in, in Q4, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Q4 2020, Pfizer came out and said, hey, we're seeing, you know, 90% effectiveness mm -hmm. of our, of our uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, that may be the case, but the perception out there being what you mentioned, uh, you know, that flu vaccines, you're encouraged by everyone, you know, especially if you're elderly or immunocompromised to receive a flu vaccine. Um there's a lot of, uh, I guess, laggard behavior out there, given the fact that the, the, the effectiveness of, of the vaccine isn't that strong anyway. And that will, in my mind, kind of impact acceptance of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, regardless of whether, <laughs> as a matter of fact, R Russia says that theirs is doing better, right? Did you read that? <laughs> right. A couple of percent better. Sputnik's <laughs> doing 92% or 92% or 94%. Exactly. No, I mean, that's a good point. And it's great to see a vaccine effectiveness rate of uh, 90% or, or better. Yeah. Um, if you do the math, in order to achieve herd immunity with that vaccine effectiveness, you need 65% uh, of the people to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the R not value is still going to be above zero and it will continue to spread. Yeah. And and I mean, I, I, I don't expect you to have a, a fully formed data-based scientific answer to this question, but what's your perception around the reality that 65% of the population might initially, you know, accept the COVID-19 vaccine. Any, any gut on that? <laughs> My gut, uh, just from, um, you know, knowing what the, you know, the numbers are for influenza uh, and all the, you know, political aspects of COVID-19 is it'll likely be below 65%. Yeah, yeah, I would tend to agree. So uh, that's a good segue into your COVID nineteen play. I want to learn a little bit about that. Um, t tell tell us about where you are. You, there's a, a pre is a preclinical your COVID nineteen. It is, yeah, and we haven't talked about that much. Uh, we're okay. you know, just, just like with our. If you're not comfortable, oh, with no, no, fine. no, no, that's that's fine. I, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is we don't do our science by press release. Uh, so we wait till we have substantive data. Yep. And then typically we'll share that uh, either in peer reviewed publications or at scientific conferences. Uh, and then, you know, we'll talk about it more broadly. So it is preclinical, mm -hmm. but, you know, clearly, you know, inspired by the success of our influenza program, we have expanded the AVCs to COVID-19, to uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus and HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing some really compelling early data, and we hope uh, sometime next year, early next year, to be able to talk about it more broadly. Okay, cool. I want to I want to ask another sort of general philosophical question about your approach, and that is, let's say that uh, you know, Q, let's say Q1, just for conversation's sake, Q1 
2021, you've got an AVC that's uh, approved and ready to go commercial. What do you anticipate from a, you know, I, I hit on two things uh, that, 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 that I wanted some clarity on. One, is it a vaccine? Is it a therapeutic? Two, is it a large molecule? Is it a small molecule? Given that your your solution set sort of falls into a, a, a new frontier, right? A, 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 a different kind of a, a approach. Um, what concerns do you have or challenges do you foresee around the marketability, the, you know, sort of commercial acceptance of, of AVCs um, when you're ready to, to, you know, to, to put these out there to, uh, for, 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 for consumption. Is there any concern there? Like, Hey, this is something that we haven't seen before. You know, it doesn't fall neatly into a bucket that we're familiar with. I, I think that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we are developing it as a long acting drug yeah, mm-hmm. very similar, you know, you know, to our antifungal program, which is a long acting antifungal, right? That's so once a week dosing, this is going to be every once, you know, once every three to six months dosing. Mm -hmm. So it is a drug. Uh, It just happens to have an immune effector function, uh, which adds to the potency. So we're not marketing it as a vaccine, certainly, because it's definitely not that. Uh, People are familiar with monoclonal antibodies, which do have an immune effector function. Uh, So, you know, uh, people tend not to have problems with, um, you know, figuring out what the modality is. Uh, Really, it's the data that will drive the progress of the program. And, you know, maybe more specifically, you know, one of the phase three clinical trials for resifungin is for the prevention of fungal infections in blood and marrow transplant patients. These are, you know, all cancer patients. Uh, you know, they're either AML, ALL, or you know, solid organ transplant patients that ultimately have to get a bone marrow or blood and marrow transplant. Uh, very vulnerable to a variety of infections. Uh, fungal infections, very lethal. If you know that patient because they have a debilitated immune system. Similarly, uh, viral infections. So one of the populations we are evaluating for our AVCs are actually in the same population. Uh, These are the high risk populations that should they get any type of infection, whether fungal, viral, or bacterial, uh, they have a very high mortality rate. And so that actually fits quite well with our current approach uh, and the uh, initial populations that we will be building a a, um, commercial strategy around. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, Dr. Stein, what have I not asked you that I should have being the uh, not not so stellar interviewer that I am? I'm going to give you an opportunity <laughs> to yeah, hit, hit on some concluding thoughts and 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 uh, share with me and our audience what I what what I haven't asked that I should have. Well, Matt, I'll, I'll correct you. you. You're probably one of the better interviewers I've had. Very conversational, so I want to compliment you. Oh, so. I appreciate that. Com- compels me to want to listen to uh, some of your other interviews. So we'll, we'll start with that. Um, you know, one of the questions you usually get is, well, where do you see Sidera going in, you know, next three to five years? How are you going to position the company? Are you going to position it to be acquired? Are you going to position it, you know, to be a standalone company? Um, I, I would have, I would have totally thought a question like that would be far too forward to ask you in a, in a publicly <laughs> consumed uh, format. But hey, if you want to tackle it, you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I draw the analogy to my prior company, Trius, where you know, we founded that on a preclinical, in that case, antibacterial molecule. Uh, we you know, did initial venture rounds, put it into the clinic, uh, got successful and uh, compelling phase two data on the strength of that phase two data. We uh, announced or signed a partnership agreement with Bayer Pharmaceuticals for uh, the commercialization outside of the U.S. and Europe. Um, That partnership actually helped finance the phase three program, uh, announced positive phase three data in late 2012, uh, started partnership discussions for European territory in 2013. Ultimately, the company was acquired for $707 million by Cubist in 2013. So fast forward uh, to Sidera, 
founded Sidera on a, you know, a preclinical molecule, resofungin, uh, and this CloudBreak platform, which differentiates us from Trias, uh, put that into the clinic, uh, generated phase two data uh, in uh, July of 2019. Uh, September 2019, uh, we signed a partnership agreement for outside the US and Japan with Mundi Pharma. The proceeds of that partnership is taking us into, you know, through phase three, helping to co-fund phase three. We're on track to announce top line data uh, of the first of our two phase three studies at the end of next year. Uh, so, you know, fill in the next steps. Will we have an opportunity to transact? Potentially, but we also have this cloud break platform. So we have more options at Sidera. We yeah. may have an opportunity for an acquisition, but, you know, the old adage is, you know, uh, companies are bought and not sold. So that's really not going to be part of our strategy. We're right now preparing for commercialization. So we'll, we'll see where it goes, but certainly we've got a track record of success. Many of my team members from Trius are with me at Sidera. And so uh, we've, uh, you know, been down that path, have uh, run, you know, various plays in the past, and hopefully we'll have those options in the future. Yeah, I've often considered, uh, you know, since I've been covering this space and talking to, to folks like you who have, um, you know, em embraced that, the, the, the business side, right, the transactional side, the buying and selling. And um, I, I've come to appreciate that partnership angle where you maintain involvement in the, in the products because I, you know, I, I often scratch my head at, at people who aren't so in invested for, you know, 10, 12 years in, in a product that just gets bought wholesale you know, it's completely gone. It's like, you know, it'd be like, uh, it'd be like giving up my 16 year old son for adoption right now. I just, I don't think I could, I don't think I could bear it. I'd want to, uh, you know, to maintain some semblance of uh, involvement there. Uh, so I appreciate, you know, the, the nuance, right. Of, uh, of the next steps um, yeah. in companies like yours. Yeah. You know, we um, you know, were purchased by, Trius was purchased by Cubis, but several months after that purchase, Cubis was bought by Merck. Right. Uh, and we have some former Trius employees who became Cubist employees and became Merck employees. And some of them are still there. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I wish you luck and uh, continued success. It's a, been a fascinating conversation. We'll be following along, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and I'd love to have you back at some point when we've got more to talk about and you guys are taking the next steps. Absolutely. Matt, it's been a real pleasure. Look forward to uh, having a, another discussion in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. All right. Bye-bye. So that's Dr. Jeffrey Stein. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online and sponsored by Cytiva, which offers a trove of excellent resources for new and emerging biotechs at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Go check them out. Please subscribe to our newsletter at bioprocessonline.com. And in the meantime, thanks for listening.